Um, hello, everyone. Um, welcome uh, to day four of our annual conference, the Global Empowerment Meetings. Um, I'm really excited to, to, to welcome all of you, both uh, those who are joining our panel, um, those who are attending, and those who are watching the live stream uh, as well. So we've had a pretty exciting week so far, and we're kind of continuing with the theme of the conference. Uh, the conference theme was re-encountering Homo Morales, um, making sense of a seemingly irrational world. Um, we started Monday with um, uh, some, some sort of uh, policy and civil society leaders talking a bit about how uh, one can think of overcoming polarization in their context. Uh, we then on Tuesday had uh, a deeper dive into understanding the morality uh, of us and them, of diversive politics, uh, uh, divisiveness in general. Uh, yesterday we had a double session where we started with a celebratory Nobel session where we uh, heard from the three Nobel laureates in economics from 2019, um, and then followed by uh, Michelle Galfan on a keynote where she talked a bit about the tightness and looseness of cultures and how that affects uh, behavior. Today, we're really excited uh, to continue uh, uh, these themes and talk a bit about now the politics of us versus them, obviously something which is front and uh, center in most of our minds, uh, both those who are in the US, but also the world over. Um, uh, so without further ado, I wanted to hand over to Ben, uh, who will be moderating the session. Uh, thank you so much for uh, doing so, Ben. Thank you very much, Asim. Uh, and thank you all very much for joining us here today. Uh, my name is Ben Enke. I am an associate professor in uh, Harvard's uh, economics department. And I will have the privilege of uh, moderating uh, today's panel discussion, uh, where we will be interested in understanding the politics of us and them. Um, so we're going to be concerned with questions like, you know, how do economic, social, and cultural factors contribute to increasing political polarization and the right and the rise of um, populist movements. And in trying to make progress on these issues, uh, we're gonna have a panel that will bring different perspectives uh, to these issues. Uh, so first, uh, I'm very happy to have here with me uh, Liliana Mason, who's an associate professor of government and politics at the University of Maryland uh, College Park. Uh, much of Liliana's recent research is on uh, political psychology. In particular, she's the author of the uh, widely uh, cited book, Uncivil agreement in which she identifies the role of social identity concerns in contemporary politics. We then have here with us uh, Leo Burstein, who is a professor of economics at the University of Chicago. Uh, Leo is one of the most productive and most creative uh, political economists of his generation. Uh, in particular, his work has attracted interest um, for, uh, for his identifying the importance of social norms and social image concerns in political and economic behavior. And then finally, uh, we have Dani Rodwick, uh, who's a professor of international political economy uh, at, the, at the Kennedy School here at Harvard. Uh, Dani is uh, a distinguished international and trade economist, and most of his recent work focuses on trying to understand how globalization uh, and financial liberal, liberal, liberalization have contributed uh, to the rise of populist movements around the world. Now, as you can see, all these panelists will bring uh, different perspectives uh, on the question of you know, what contributes to the emergence of the politics of us and them. And uh, to get us started, I will um, uh, talk about some of my own research uh, for about five minutes now, and then each of the panelists of the other panelists uh, will also share some opening remarks, and then we will turn it uh, into a discussion first amongst ourselves, and then hopefully uh, uh, in interaction with the audience. So now to, to get us started, uh, I'd like to draw uh, your attention to an issue that might seem uh, almost trivially true, uh, in particular when we think about it from a US perspective, uh, which is that people's policy views uh, can be loosely categorized into what we call left and right, right? So where these policy labels are associated with entire bundles of policy views, right? So people on the left support uh, a strong redistributive welfare state, for example, but also environmental protection, affirmative action, universal healthcare, uh, whereas people on the right uh, support you know, uh, strong government in the domains of police and law enforcement, 
border control uh, and military. And you know, these uh, basic facts have become uh, almost universally accepted and they are almost, you know, they are so obviously true uh, that it's not even worth talking about them so much. But it's somewhat interesting to, to think about the structure of these ideological clusters. So the fact that the political left and the political right uh, both support different types of government expenditure when we try to compare the US with other Western countries. So this is what I, I want to draw your attention to now uh, on the next slide, where I'm going to show you um, sort of in, a, in a, um, a compressed form the results of a large scale international survey uh, that we ran uh, in the US, in Australia, Germany, France, and Sweden where we essentially ask people uh, how much government they would like, uh, so how much government expenditure they would like for eight different policy categories, uh, border control, military spending, police and law enforcement, foreign aid, affirmative action, environmental uh, regulation and protection, universal healthcare and welfare. Um, and then what this figure here shows you is which types of policy views tend to go together in the different countries. So here, the blue dots represent the US. And what this shows you is that in the US, people who support strong border control also support a strong military, strong police and law enforcement, but they don't support foreign aid, affirmative action, environmental regulation, universal healthcare, and welfare. This is the pattern I initially discussed. But now what's so stunning about this figure here is that you get exactly the same clusters, the same structures everywhere in the Western world. You can look at Australia, Germany, France, and Sweden, and in fact, many other countries. And what you'll find is that in each of those countries, people who support a strong military oppose environmental protection. People who support a strong welfare state oppose strong police and law enforcement. And now that of course holds true, even though all of these countries have vastly different electoral systems and party structures. So then the question that emerges here is, you know, why do we observe these particular policy clusters? Why isn't it true that, you know, these policy clusters differ around the world? Why isn't it that sometimes people who support a strong welfare state also support a strong military? You know, there is no law of nature that somehow requires that people who support environmental protection oppose a strong military. It seems like if anything, these two policy domains are pretty unrelated. But it, there's got to be something that generates this particular structure of policy views, this polarization in terms of issue positions. So the, the central proposition behind a, a research agenda that, that my collaborators and I have launched is that what explains this particular structure of policy views is heterogeneity in what we refer to as moral universalism. So to understand what I'm talking about here, consider this figure where the y-axis denotes your altruism towards others. And the x-axis denotes you know, an abstract construct of social distance from you. So you are here. And then you know, at close social distance, that this might be your, your nuclear family, your extended family, your friends, your neighbors, um, people in your same city, people who share your religious beliefs. Uh, these are foreigners. And these are people you've never met, say. You know, the idea of moral universalism is that Suppose everybody is equally altruistic on average, then it may still be that the extent to which altruism declines as a function of social distance varies across people where we think of a full universalist as someone who does not distinguish in the way they expand altruism towards others between their family and a random stranger. Right? So somebody who's low on universalism is not less moral. If anything, you know, that person is more altruistic towards their friends, their family and their neighbors but they are less altruistic towards faraway people. Okay, so the crucial feature here is not how moral someone is, it's just how uniformly a given moral budget is allocated across people uh, that are at different moral distances uh, from yourself. And of course, in surveys, we can measure this object, we can measure the extent to which uh, altruism declines as a function of social distance by asking survey respondents questions like, you know, if I gave you $100, how would you split these $100? If you couldn't, you know, if, if uh, it wasn't possible for you to give any money for yourself, how would you split these $100 between one of your neighbors and a randomly selected person who lives in the US? And so now when you do this, so when you elicit these moral views 
in large scale surveys, not just in the US, but in the different countries that I showed you earlier, then what you get as a result, and this is what I'm showing you here, is that this concept of universalism reproduces the cluster of ideological views, of political views that I alluded to earlier. Which is to say, what this figure shows is that people who score high, quote unquote, on the universalism dimension, they support government expenditure on foreign aid, affirmative action, environmental protection, universal healthcare, and welfare, but they want smaller government in these traditionally conservative domains. So what this is saying is that universalists don't want more or less government in general, they just want more government in these, what we think of as relatively universalistic domains, and in these non-universalist domains. So what we're proposing here is a concept that tries to explain why we observe these different policy structures uh, around the world. So now, um, these are my opening remarks. I'm not, uh, I'm not going to uh, unshare my screen and invite Liliana uh, to come forward and uh, uh, share some of her own recent work to get us started. Hi, thank you so much uh, for that introduction and also for uh, that very uh, interesting uh, research. I am going to try to share my screen. Okay. Uh, so what I'm gonna talk about today is uh, just sort of trying to separate the concepts of um, how identity affects our politics and how actual, you know, what we think of as rational um, policy uh, attitudes affect our politics. And, and so, you know, ideally we think of a democracy as being, uh, you know, people voting based on these rational policy-based ideas. Uh, and that's what guides, uh, that's what guides our politics. So uh, I'm going to focus on, this is just for American politics, uh, this data. So basically, this is from the, the American National Election Studies in 2016. Um, people were asked about five different issues that were pretty controversial. It was immigration, abortion, um, same-sex marriage, healthcare, and government spending. And, uh, and each of these, you know, people's, people's responses were, you know, rated from like the most liberal, which I'm, I'm coding zero to the most conservative, which I'm coding one. And if you just take the mean of everyone's uh, responses, what you'll see is that uh, while Democrats and Republicans in the left panel, while Democrats and Republicans are different from one another, um, they're not very different from one another. And in fact, the, the average uh, score for Republicans on these issue positions is to the left of the midpoint, right? So if 0.5 is, uh, is actually purely moderate, Republicans are actually slightly to the left. And this, this finding has actually been uh, reported in, in other studies. Um, I thought maybe we could think of it as, as constraint instead of average, right? So how, what percentage of the issues are people on the correct side for their party? And again, but for both Republicans and Democrats, it's not even you know it's it's not even fifty percent uh, of consistency in their issue positions. So effectively, what, what this looks like is an electorate that is uh, there's in which there's plenty of room for people to compromise. Right? There should be a lot of issue positions that Republicans and Democrats agree on. This does not look like a polarized electorate. But if we look at how Democrats and Republicans feel about one another, we see a very different electorate. So uh, on a feeling thermometer, which is, you know, if you, if you feel very coldly towards this group, you, you rate them zero. If you feel very warmly, you rate them 100. Democrats rate Republicans at 27 degrees, which is quite cold. And they rate fellow Democrats at 75 degrees, which is very warm. It's a mirror image for Republicans. They, they rate fellow Republicans at 73 degrees and, and outgroup Democrats at 28 degrees. This looks like a polarized electorate in terms of the way people are thinking about their, their partisan in-group and out-group, but it's not matched by those issue positions, which makes it sort of a puzzle. Um, and this is really what my research is about, is trying to understand this puzzle. So the quick answer for this is that the, the United States has been sorting, I, I call it social sorting, has basically been sorting so that Democrats and Republicans are growing much more socially different from one another. So this, this is showing you a picture in 1972 of for each of these groups on the left, the percentage of Republicans in that group for, minus the percentage of Democrats in that group. That's what each bar is showing you. And I won't go through all of them, but effectively, um, even for conservatives and liberals, these differences within, you know, uh, uh, the partisan differences within the group are not very large. They're only at the most, you know, less than 25 percentage points difference in, in, in um, 
in the difference between Democrats and Republicans in the group in 1972. What we see in 2016, though, is a much different picture uh, where all of a sudden the differences between, uh, between Democrats and Republicans, these social differences get much, much larger and they get much larger in some very crucial areas, particularly self-identified conservatives and liberals are extremely polarized by party. Um, religion, which had not been, you see church attenders in 1972, there was no partisan difference. That becomes a partisan difference. And in fact, um, both Catholics and Protestants in, in 2016 are Republicans, whereas th they were opposite parties in 1972, uh, which means that there is a religion, non-religion difference between the parties and white and black, um, the racial differences between the parties have expanded. So the question is, what does this do to us psycho psychologically, right? When, when the outgroup party is different from you racially, religiously, culturally, what does that do to us in terms of the way we think about the other party, regardless of what we think about policy uh, and governing? And so this is a, a sort of summary figure uh, where I am looking at, I ask people how willing they would be to uh, be neighbors, be friends, be coworkers, or marry members of the in party versus members of the out party. And so this is the difference between those two ratings. And I look at it across levels of issue extremity. And in this particular figure, I'm mainly looking at strong partisans. So every, everyone in this figure is a strong partisan, but either they have cross-cutting racial, uh, religious, and ideological identity um, identities, or they have well-aligned or sorted identities. And what you can see is across levels of issue extremity, the people who have cross-cutting identities, so the low sorting, high partisanship people, the lighter gray bar, are, are, much, are much sort of more willing uh, to spend time with, with the outgroup than, than the people who have well-sorted identities. So effectively what we're seeing is, regardless of issue extremity, there is this force, this social force that is driving Democrats and Republicans apart, um, which cannot be resolved by policy, by policy interventions. And, and so should be really understood to be a, a sort of deep social psychological divide um, if, we're going, if we're going to address it um, in a productive way. So I'll end there and uh, looking forward to hearing the rest of the presentations. Thanks, Eliana. Uh, Leo, feel free to, yeah. Hey, thanks again for, uh, for inviting me and also for these uh, very interesting and exciting uh, uh, presentations. Uh, I'm gonna be talking briefly about some research. Uh, this is based on a, on, on a, a recent uh, paper that I've worked on with co-authors, uh, the elections and the erosion of social norms. I'll get started with, the, with the, an anecdote. So suppose this is early 2015 in New York bigot. Okay, in particular, you don't like foreigners, you're a xenophobe. So you've been taught your whole life that it's not okay to be a bigot. So you keep it to yourself. You don't express your, your xenophobia to other people and other people don't learn that you're a xenophobe. Perhaps the exception of those immediately around you in your social circle. Likewise, other xenophobes also keep it to themselves. They don't talk about it. So that's where we start. And then the presidential campaign starts in 2015 to, um, uh, with uh, one of the candidates uh, openly embracing xenophobia from the start. Um, so this paper is gonna argue that Trump's rise in popularity uh, and eventual electoral victory increased the social, social acceptability of xenophobia, thus uh, eroded previously existing, uh, previously existing social norms of tolerance. Okay, so we start with you know, the xenophobe side. Okay, as I said before that, he, the election you thought, okay, it's not okay to be a xenophobe, I'll keep it to myself. And you see a candidate that is endorsing these views and this candidate is actually very popular. Eventually he wins the election. Uh, so what happens in your head? You think, well, I thought this, this position, these types of views were like really fringe, uh, really extreme, but in fact, there are many more people that agree with them. If there are many more people who agree with them, I don't need to be quiet about it. I'm not gonna be judged to the extent I thought that would be judged. Okay? So how do we establish this? So, uh, uh, we ran a series of experiments. Uh, in particular, uh, the first set of experiments we ran uh, was right before and right after the 2016 election. Uh, just to look, there's a lot of information in this graph, so I'm just going to uh, go very briefly. 
the main points. The idea here is like, what, what is the willingness of uh, uh, experimental participants or respondents to donate money to a xenophobic organization, an organization that openly uh, uh, opposes any kind of immigration? Uh, uh, and this, um, this fir first four bars are about, it happened two weeks before the election, okay? And what we did is that we manipulated people's perceptions of Trump's popularity in their state. Uh, and we asked them to make a donation that was either anonymous or public, okay? So what we see is that in the absence here, in the absence of manipulating the perceptions about Trump's popularity, about half of them donating in private, but we see a big drop in the willingness to donate, donate in public, indicating that there's some embarrassment, some shame associated with this action. Once you increase the perceptions about Trump's popularity, what we see is that this gap existing here disappears. So then we learn that Trump is more popular, they don't feel embarrassed to make this, this uh, statement, this action anymore. Now, what we see is that if you replicate the same experiment after the election, uh, using Trump's election as, so to speak, the, the treatment, uh, you see that there's no longer a difference in their willingness to donate in private or public. So any shame or embarrassment associated with this action is, is gone. We replicate this uh, in another setting from the interest of time. I'm just uh, where we, you know, in, in areas that were swing, uh, we manipulate whether people are aware that locally either Clinton or Trump won uh, in the election. And we see a similar pattern of uh, learning that Trump is actually more popular locally reduces any, any gap between donations in private and public. That's the xenophobe side. That person feels more comfortable expressing it. Now, what happens, and now that's the part that I think is less obvious and I think more concerning, suppose you're actually not a xenophobe and you don't like xenophobia. How are you gonna judge someone for expressing xenophobia? Okay, suppose that there is a situation where you think, we all think that no one is a bigot and someone starts saying bigotry, okay. You're gonna, your inference is that if that person saying those things in a setting where no one likes it, that person must be a real bigot. There's no reason for them to pretend to be one. They're saying it in spite of an anticipated social cost of doing it. Now, suppose there's a new setting, a new normal where you think, well, actually there are quite a few xenophobes out there. And then you observe someone expressing xenophobia. Now what happens to inference? Well, you're not so sure anymore. It could be that that person is a xenophobe. It could be that that person just understands that there are a lot of xenophobes out there and they just pander into the, the perception of what the majority is. Okay, so your inference about how someone, how xenophobic someone is upon expressing xenophobia is changed, okay? And that's what we also study here. And again, uh, we don't, I don't have a lot of time. So I'm just gonna say here, I get someone who's a, a Democrat uh, who actually previously expressed support for immigration and so on. Uh, and we ask them to split money between themselves and someone else from another experiment. And we tell them that that person from the other experiment uh, donated money to an immigration organization. So you expect that person to be punished by the first uh, respondent, right? Um, uh, and what we manipulate is whether we told uh, the person who's deciding the allocation of money, uh, whether that's that other person uh, uh, lives in an area where Clinton won or Trump won, and whether or not that decision to donate to the uh, anti-immigration organization was private or uh, observed by people in their area. What we see here is this interesting pattern is that uh, in private, you punish the person, you only donate 78 cents on average uh, out of $2 uh, because, well, that person has no reason to pretend to be a xenophobe in private. That's who they really are. Now in public, in an area where Clinton won, you also punish the person um, in the sense that, well, if that person is expressing xenophobia in public in an area where Clinton won, a person must be really xenophobic because there's no reason to pretend to xenophobic in that social environment. Now, if you express xenophobia in public in an area where Trump won, now you give them a, a pass. You know, no matter how we look at this, there are different types of outcomes. Uh, people become more generous toward them. The understanding here, and we you know, follow up with other questions, the understanding is that, well, if that person is acting like a xenophobe in an area where Trump won, maybe they just are feeling pressure to be a xenophobe, for example. So the idea here is that Trump's rising popularity not only made xenophobes more comfortable expressing it, just got them out of the closets, closet, so to speak, but also made non-xenophobes more tolerant towards xenophobic behavior on average, in the sense that they understand that now the norms have changed and they're willing to give a pass. Okay. So it's, it's a pretty depressing set of findings. And I uh, just that we document in this paper and, and I'll, I'll stop here.
Thanks, Leo. Finally, we have uh, Danny delivering some introductory remarks. Thank you, thank you, Ben, and and and, and thank you, uh, the previous speakers. It's, it's been very interesting. Um, um, ben talked about um, uh, the importance of values, uh, emphasizing um, what he called the heterogeneity and moral uh, universalism. Um, Liliana talked about uh, deep uh, social psychological uh, divide. Leo talked about uh, the erosion of social norms. I want to talk about uh, economics, um, about um, uh, the uh, economic roots um, of um, uh, political polarization and the rise of uh, particularly far right, uh, right wing uh, populists. Um, I, I think at, at the beginning, it's, it's important to um, to distinguish between uh, two different types of questions. Um, and one is um, uh, the question of whether we want to understand um, why is it that uh, so many people vote for a populist candidate or a um, right-wing uh, xenophobic candidate uh, at any point in time. So this is a kind of a, it's a question about the levels of support for two different types of um, parties or two different types of political positions. Um, but there is a, a somewhat different uh, second question, which is really about what has happened over time, a question about changes. And that question would be, um, why did the uh, populist vote share increase so much uh, in recent years? So why did uh, uh, Trump, um, um, why did the Republican Party become more populist over time? Why is the populist vote share in, uh, in different parts of oh, in Europe um, has increased over time? Um, and I think that's a somewhat different uh, question because we're trying to not understand why is it that there are some of these deep uh, racial, um, deep cultural uh, values driven or um, uh, social um, uh, phenomena that sort of divide society have always uh, have divided. But we're trying to understand why is that this divide has gotten bigger, uh, has changed, has increased over time. Um, and I think um, the reason that I think economics has a leverage on this question uh, is because um, unlike many of the other determinants uh, that people have talked about in terms of um, what's driving populism, uh, economics, economic conditions actually have changed. Um, so things like values and culture, these are things that, that um, generally transform very slowly um, and, um, and, and a constant cannot explain a change. Um, so in general, I think that things like norms or um, a culture or values uh, are, 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 are unlikely to do a very good job um, in trying to explain um, uh, this change in, in political outcomes. Uh, on the economics dimension, I think um, we clearly have had measurable changes in economic uh, conditions uh, since um, the 1990s. We have uh, increased economic insecurity of um, lower middle classes in the advanced economies uh, that's driven by process of deindustrialization um, and you know, uh, an intensification of economic globalization, uh, a process of intense technological change. Um, and we can see the consequences uh, in two different kinds of domains. One is in, in what's been called labor market polarization, that is that if you look at the distribution of jobs, um, essentially the middle part of jobs, uh, the middle skilled jobs have been collapsing pretty much everywhere. Um, and, and so that's since that's the foundation of, of middle classes and, and lower middle class incomes. Uh, so there's been a, a significant uh, squeeze on lower middle uh, classes and a squeeze on middle classes in general. And, and, and the spatial version of this is that we have seen uh, a significant divergence regionally and spatially uh, between parts of countries that are doing well, that are well connected to the world economy, that are uh, using advanced forms of production, um, 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 uh, uh, contemporary technologies, and uh, either sort of smaller towns and smaller urban areas or uh, rural parts of the country in the United States where in fact uh, economic fortunes um, have, um, have, been, um, uh, have been much worse. Now, uh, I think 
if you if if so that I think in my mind makes um, many of these uh, underlying economic shocks, uh, economic changes, increases economic insecurity, uh, economic um, uh, uh, um, anxieties as one of the important drivers uh, of this uh, problem of increased political polarization and the rise of, of right wing uh, populism. Um, that does not mean that values, culture, um, social sorting, those kinds of things um, have been unimportant. Uh, but I think what has happened is that these economic shocks have largely worked through these uh, uh, other kind of phenomena, these uh, cultural values phenomena. So but in, in, in those circumstances, I think the theory would be that cultural values um, are, are largely sort of intermediate variable rather than the ultimate driver or ultimate source of the shock. And indeed, there are, there's, there's a lot of um, evidence that suggests that, uh, that the uh, economic shocks like um, trade shocks, globalization shocks, uh, work through uh, culture uh, in, and, 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 and culture serves to amplify uh, the political effects or the polariz polarizing effects of these economic shocks. Um, let me emphasize, let me just um, lay out two particular channels um, through which this happens. One on the demand side of politics, that is with respect to individuals' preferences. Uh, another one on the supply side of politics, that is with regard to uh, party strategies or the strategies of political movements. Now, on the demand side of politics, I think the, the, the causal story would go that as economic insecurity increases, uh, that there is in general uh, people sort of ex, you know tend to adopt uh, more local identities and try to, and, and and start to um, look with much greater suspicion uh, and and intolerance uh, towards others, uh, whether those might be the urbanites, the ethnic minorities, the immigrants. Um, so I think economic shocks that heighten these feelings of, of uh, economic insecurity can induce voters to make sharper distinctions between uh, us um, and uh, ethnic, religious, or racial outsiders, them. Um, and so in this, um, uh, it's in this causal framework, what's really happening is that economic shocks are triggering psychosocial processes that, that alter individual preferences and identities. Um, the, the, the second channel through the supply side, I think, is, 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 is very interesting, and, and that's um, that essentially what has happened uh, is that increased inequality and economic anxiety um, has meant that the median voter in, um, in the advanced countries has moved further away uh, from the types of policies that conservative parties or right-wing parties prefer. Um, because those they want um, less taxes, fewer transfers, uh, but um, the median voter is in fact in greater need of them given uh, greater inequality and insecurity. Um, so what happens then is that the, right, the conservative or the right-wing party responds uh, because it is less able to compete on its economic policies. The right-wing party responds uh, on um, by priming identity, cultural or values types of issues through its messaging. So for the party of the rich, now there's a much higher return from a political narrative that catalyzes identity uh, around issues such as racial resentment, gay marriage, women's rights, immigration, um, all of which can give certain low income voters a reason to vote uh, against their purely economic interests uh, but much more on, on the side of these um, sort of um, these identity uh, issues. There's a great uh, explanation of this in the foreign context uh, in the recent book by uh, Jacob Hacker and Paul Pearson, uh, which I recommend everybody to read. It's called Let Them Eat Tweets. Um, and what Hacker and Pearson argue is that this is exactly what the Republican Party has done in the United States as inequality began to rise after the 1970s. Um, and, uh, and, and so what they have done is, is, is uh, that the party adopted a, a racially charged narrative uh, to, en to enhance the appeal of what were essentially regressive economic policies uh, to middle and low middle class uh, white voters. Um, they cite um, an interview, uh, which was supposed to be secret for a long time, but actually was um, uh, became public uh, of a Republican political operative Lee Atwater, uh, 
uh, in, back in 1981, uh, where he talks explicitly about Republicans must use a language that is, you know, in his work, a lot more abstract than using the N word uh, as Edward Water tells the interviewer, uh, but but must can still signal uh, and, and heighten uh, racial resentment. Uh, so policies that benefit the rich have, can, has to have to be packaged in terms that would resonate with poorer white voters. So an example that he cites is, uh, so you say, we want to cut this uh, program in a way that would convey the idea that in fact, blacks would get hurt worse than the whites. Um, and, um, and, and, and this is a way to, to make the program appealing. And as Hacker and Pearson put it, essentially Republicans use white identity to defend wealth inequality. Um, so all of this suggests that often what looks like um, a, a processes that might have cultural, re, cultural um, uh, uh, roots uh, may be driven by, by economic shocks as well. Uh, another way of, of saying this is that basically that economists want to take credit for everything, even when the outcome is a bad thing. Um, and, um, and so that sort of would be the, uh, the, the, the economic roots uh, explanation of um, what we have been observing. Uh, thank you, Danny, very much. Uh, I think uh, this was a, a great way to uh, get us started on the discussion. So I, I will now open it up to our panelists uh, to debate each other. I'm, I'm going to start out actually by following up uh, on a very important point that uh, Danny just made. Um, so let me uh, reiterate that a little bit, um, which is that, so Danny emphasized the changes in economic conditions that we've observed uh, over the last 20 or 30 years, uh, the decline of the middle class, uh, disappear, the disappearing manufacturing establishments. Um, and then of course, a standard economic view would, would be that as inequality increases and jobs disappear, people turn to left-wing parties. They demand more redistribution, uh, more social protection. Uh, but instead, what we see in the data is that those people uh, that tend to have lost jobs due to globalization, outsourcing, and so on, that they turn to right-wing populist movements instead. So that, of course, poses a challenge to the traditional economic way of thinking about it, because again, economists would have predicted that they turned to far left parties to demand more redistribution. So now Danny has sort of uh, uh, taken uh, a middle of the road stance here by proposing that right wing parties have responded to this strategic challenge by increasingly priming people's social and moral identity concerns, uh, and thereby you know, trying to make them forget what their actual economic concerns are. Um, but then the question to me here, Dani, is, you know, why do these strategic appeals work, right? So shouldn't it be that if I, as a white voter, uh, I've gotten, you know, successively poorer over the last 20 years, why should it be that today I care more about identity primes than 20 years ago? Why isn't it that I only pay attention to how much money I have in my pocket and that is what I uh, vote upon? That, I, that is what I vote based on. I, I mean, I, I think the answer is that um, that voting is always based on a mixture of, uh, of, of motives, that it's, it's never just your economic objectives. It also has a lot to do with, with who you are. Um, so voting is an act of both uh, um, you know, we're, I feel embarrassed talking with, you know, when the, you know, in the, in the, with, a, with a political scientist on, on our panel, but, um, you know, that from what I understand, um, even the political science view would be that a part of it is, you know, you, you vote for candidates who think that you might get you policies or programs that serve your economic needs, but it's also voting is also an act of asserting who you are. Um, uh, and, and, um, and so, it, it's always a balance between the two. And I think the priming that you mentioned um, has, uh, has, has worked to increase the, um, uh, the weight on, uh, on, on the identity dimension on, on who we are. Um, there's something else that has been happened. I thought you were going to ask that question because there's a second puzzle that this raises, which is what, 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 you know, why, where have the left been? <laughs> why is it that they have not been able to, 
uh, develop the right programs and counter the strategy. Um, and uh, I think the answer to that question is that um, uh, that you know the parties of the left um, have, a, 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 and this is something that uh, Thomas Piketty shows in his in his work that have become increasingly captured by sort of more and more educated elites, um, and have were at least initially when these shocks happened were unable to develop programmatically because they were the, they were actually the promoters of the kinds of globalization. Um, that you know was like new labor in in the UK. It was the socialist in France. It was the social democrats uh, in Germany who were sort of some of the, and, and the Democrats, the Clinton Democrats in the United States, who had been actually behind NAFTA and and, and um, so uh, so you know they were not in a position to appropriately respond. And I think we see now that is changing with you know how Biden is a, a sort of a centrist candidate, but you know his platform. Is is way to the left from what Hillary Clinton's was four years ago. So there is, I think, a delayed response. Right. I think this this is an interesting question also for uh, Liliana. So she talked about um, the increase. Can I inter Can I interject a little bit at, oh, at something to, to the, that part of the discussion? So I think I wonder, and I would like to get Danny's thought on this too, just because we're on that subject. Um, to what extent uh, there is an as a psychological aspect of, of, of blaming an outgroup? Suppose, you know, you're blue collar, uh, white male in the US and, you know, the type of uh, uh, human capital investment you made in the past is no longer super valuable and so on. And, you know, you can either accept that and, you know, realize that you're so quote unquote a loser now, or you can just embrace uh, some rhetoric that, no, this is not your fault. It, someone else's fault is, is, is unfair competition from China or, or you know, it, I, I wonder if there's also this aspect of it's easier psychologically on the person to blame someone else for their failure than actually take, take it to themselves. And, and I think that I wonder to what extent this is actually helping uh, gr gr uh, the growth of, 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 of these populist movements. I just want to see what, what you guys think of, of this, this hypothesis. Uh, it, I so first, I just want to um, mention that there there is some new political science work um, that's found that's found that Trump supporters are not so much um, poor, like lower class, but they are the wealthiest people in the poorest areas. So it's not that they are the poorest people in the U.S. It's it's that they have high status in a in a very poor area, and I think that kind of maybe uh, can, can address Leo's question, which is, you know, often we hear, you know, why, why are they voting against their own interests, right? When you have lower income people voting for economic policies that don't help them. Uh, and part of the answer is that our interests are not just economic, our interests are also, you know, sort of identity based and, and um, self esteem based. And so if you're, if you're concerned about your, your place, your status in society, um, you need to vote to make sure that you maintain that status in society. And if it's precarious, like for instance, if you're a wealthy person in a poor area, um, then it feels even more urgent to make sure that you keep that status. Whereas if you're already at a low status, there's not much you can lose. And so that type of threat isn't as potent as, as it is for people who already have some level of status, but not, you know, not the highest level. That is a real threat. And, and I think that's what a lot of the identity-based campaigning is really getting at is that that's a real interest for people. It's not just economic, it's also this sense of high, higher status than at least somebody else. But if you, if you look at the switchers, that is to say, I think, you know, um, I, I'm not, I don't know the study that Liliana is, is mentioning, but if you look at the people who switched from vote, having voted for um, Obama uh, four years earlier, um, and then uh, decided to vote for Trump in 2016, um, they do express uh, views that are sort of much more worrisome, you know, worried about things like economic insecurity. Um, so it is true that if you look at who voted for Trump in general, you know, they're wealthier. I mean, but that's also because Republicans in general are wealthier. If you focus on, on the switchers, the people who sort of switched uh, 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 to vote for, for, for Trump, you see much more evidence that there is economic insecurity, various views on trade or immigration, 
um, uh, more favorable to bank regulation and things like that. So it, it, there is a difference between who sort of the average Trump voter and the, and the, and, and, and the ones who made a difference at the margin, which is actually the ones who switched. Perhaps the resolution of the, of the puzzle that uh, we're discussing here is that um, these voters are not poor today. You know, as Liliana said, they are among the wealthiest uh, in their local area, but they perceive a threat of status loss. So they anticipate uh, a loss in income in the future, and that is what they, uh, um, what they consider in their voting decision today. Um, so this brings me to a related issue that, uh, that Dani mentioned, and which I think is uh, closely related to the, um, to the fascinating presentation that Liliana uh, provided earlier uh, on the role of social identity concerns in politics. And I wanna get back to the education cleavage in particular, um, as this is something that Liliana didn't focus on, but, but as uh, Dani said, uh, a fascinating finding is that relative to uh, the cleavages that we observed uh, 40 or 50 years ago, it's no longer true, uh, both in the US and in continental Europe, um, that the Republicans represent you know, the high income and high education elite and the Democrats, uh, uh, the poor working class. Instead, nowadays education is positively correlated with voting uh, for the left-wing party. And this is not just true in the US, it's also true in Germany for the Greens, for example. So now we have uh, sort of a difficult picture where the wealthy and the rich you know are in principle represented by the political right but the highly educated by the political left and of course that makes all of these income-based discussions a little bit complicated because high education folks are typically also relatively wealthy um so then liliana how do you think about this pattern you know why is it that this education cleavage has emerged why has it flipped over time and what does it tell us yeah, that's a really great question. And in fact, what we've seen um, over the last few decades is that, you know, historically, we've always seen that people who self-identify as working class tend to identify as Democrats, whereas people who self-identify as middle to upper class tend to identify as Republicans. Um, the class difference in party disappeared in 2016. And that's partly because educa education and income, which are highly correlated, pointed in different directions. And so that overall class difference disappeared for the first time in decades in 2016. Um, and so I think there's, you know, the part of the way to think about that is that higher education people are voting for Democrats, higher income people are still voting for Republicans, but there are different types of high education and high income people. And so you can have, you know, the difference between, um, you know, a contractor who's making $150,000 a year and a professor who's making $60,000 a year, that creates a, different, a very different sort of cultural picture of the person. And, and so the, the difference between the parties is increasingly kind of cultural. Um, it's, it, is, it is racial and religious, but it's also rural, and ur rural versus urban, um, the sort of traditional uh, social hierarchy versus um, a more progressive idea about, about social hierarchy. This is increasingly the divide between the, between the left and the right in the US at least. Um, this idea of you know, which people are, are, the, are the real Americans, which people are, um, are, uh, are, are supposed to have the highest status um, and deserve the highest status. Uh, and, and so that, that increasingly, I think, is the divide between the parties, and that's why we have this sort of education versus income conflict. Right. Um, I, I totally agree. And, and that actually brings me to my next question, which directly follows up on what you just said. And, and I think that is an issue that all of our panelists will have something interesting to, to say about, which is um, the question of why we uh, observe this uh, strategic repositioning of parties uh, along the economic and cultural domains these days, right? So traditionally, the political left and the political right in terms of their party programs um, largely differed in terms of their economic programs, right? So in the 60s, you would have had a pretty hard time telling apart the Republican and the Democratic Party program just by looking at um, their views on cultural issues. Uh, and today, that has, of course, strongly reversed, right? So it's much easier to tell apart a Democratic and a Republican politician by considering their views on moral issues than by considering their views on economic issues. Um, and that is not, again, not just true in the US. Um, so then that brings me back to the discussion that Danny provided earlier, which is, you know, given that we have observed all of these uh, economic shocks that have clearly been important, 
why is it that the parties have moved away from um, you know, distinguishing themselves along the economic dimension more towards uh, polarizing along the moral dimension? You know, if economics has become more important because now we have a you know, poorer working class increasing inequality, then why is it that the parties have taken the you know, clearly somewhat deliberate strategic decision to polarize uh, along moral issues, but not along economic issues? Is that a question for me? For everybody. <laughs> well, I think I think Danny actually pointed at at part of this, you know, by explaining that the Republican Party has over time become the the party of white men, and uh, and that really has, you know, it works for them to some extent, but in a diversifying country, it's it's not going to work forever. Um, that but that realignment of of kind of you know social identities with it, between the parties has created kind of the biggest rift between the parties is about status and who has traditional high status. So that, so it's partially because they became so socially different from each other that the, that the main difference that they're fighting over now is which side is a real American. What do the other panelists think about this strategic issue of how the parties position themselves on the economic versus moral dimension? I mean, I think, I mean, I, I think always of, of, you know, political outcomes as being, uh, you know, the joint product of both um, interests and ideas. And I think um, where, um, where the left um, uh, failed and, and where they found themselves, you know, out, outmaneuvered was that after the, um, after the collapse of sort of the Keynesian consensus, um, and sort of the ideas behind the welfare state and so forth in the 1970s, which had been the ideas, trade unionism, and uh, so sort of the ideas that had propped up uh, the political left um, in Western Europe to some extent, also in in, in the United States. Uh, it was, I think there was a period when I, you know, sort of the the the, the economic ideas um, of the left became essentially indistinct. I mean, they were. As I mentioned before, I think you know the the, the in fact um, you know the sort of the, you know, the central left became much more the driver of the policies that we now call market fundamentalism or neoliberalism uh, after the 1980s, and that's certainly true with respect to areas uh, in in international trade agreements, economic globalization, you know European financial integration was the, was the was the, was pushed by. Uh, French socialists and and so it's it's um, um, and I think the uh, so so they took on so they lost their distinct um, uh, ideational identity on the economic policy front, um, but I think this is um, and and so when 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 you know sort of the after the shocks of the two thousands and and so they they, they were outmaneuvered and they they found themselves. Uh, without a, a way of responding because they had essentially made up that ideational loss by supplying sort of social liberalism, uh, you know, sort of, uh, or, uh, which, which became increasingly, as you said, Ben, sort of their, their, their message. Uh, but, I, but I do think this is changing. So in a, in a way, we're, we're just looking at a period of adjustment. I, I do see sort of much more, if we look at the debate today uh, in the Democratic Party, even though uh, Elizabeth Warren and, 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 and Bernie Sanders uh, you know, did not win, uh, the candidacy in many ways, their idea, their ideas did um, sort of you know I think uh, you know Biden represents a set of ideas which are far more to the left of what uh, the Democratic Party has had in the last few decades. So I think we're seeing now this sort of you know a, a, a repositioning adjustments. I wouldn't be surprised if the gap opens up as as widely on economic policy front very soon and in a in a, in a lasting manner, um, and and so that what we might be observing is just a temporary disequilibrium. I just, I just wanted to add, you know, uh, you know, uh, very much related to it, the points that Iliana, Iliana was making on, uh, I, I think, you know, if you look at the, that the electorate in the US has become increasingly diverse and, and I think Republicans, just starting from the case in the US, we're realizing that, you know, it's, unless there's a realignment, uh, uh, it will be increasingly difficult to win elections, right? And so, you know, catering to the, the the old winners, you know, economic losers, uh, white males, uh, seem like a, a, a smart strategy in terms of realignment, and it seems to be paying off. 
So it's just, I think, just the, the, co the composition of the electorate was making their old alignment choices to be, you know, not very uh, productive in an electoral uh, sense. Right. Um, I think one issue that's, um, that's interesting about the discussion uh, uh, that Liliana, uh, Leo, and, and Dan just had um, is that it also touches upon, at least implicitly, on the idea of uh, elite capture of the, of the left parties, both in the US and in Europe, right? So we've talked about the, the descriptive fact that these days education is positively correlated with voting left. Uh, and of course, people uh, uh, in the high education domain uh, have less interest to advocate for strong redistributive politics, right? So uh, Dani predicted that over time, the, uh, the center left parties will revert back to holding, you know, clearly left wing views, not just on uh, cultural issues, but also on economic issues. You know, I, that may happen. I'm not so sure that, that Danny is right, precisely for the reason of, uh, that I just discussed, which is this uh, issue of elite capture, right? Uh, so now that uh, I think largely for cultural reasons, high education folks have decided that they wanna uh, go with the left party um, left parties will have a pretty hard time selling party programs that are strongly redistributive if their core base is now highly educated. Um, how do you think about that? Are, are you suggesting that um, educated people can't hold uh, progressive economic ideas? Um, I, I'm suggesting that at least, at least it goes against their material self-interest. I mean, I think it's important to note that the the left is really a coalition of a very diverse group of people. It's not entirely, it's not entirely high education, you know, uh, people. There's a very a racially diverse coalition with a lot of different interests that have to be managed. Um, and in fact, economic populism, economic, you know, progressive economic policies, if applied correctly, can can also address racial inequalities. And so the, the sort of program of the left has to take account of all of these different parts of this very diverse coalition. Um, whereas on the right, at least in the US, on the right, there's a much more homogeneous set of people who are in that party. And so they don't have to make as many compromises um, in terms of their policy positions, uh, largely because there aren't very many dissenters. Um, whereas the left is really constrained by the fact that they've got a very diverse group of people that have different interests and I think that does prevent them somewhat from moving um, entirely uh, to very far to the left but it also um, it also forces them to think about th about these policies creatively so that you know if you have a, a, a more redistributive set of policies you can also address these racial and gender inequalities and so you know possibly and climate you know climate issues and possibly you know tie all these ideas together. Can I have a question for Liliana? Um, so, um, I said, to what extent do you think? So, sometimes people talk, many times people talk about this idea of a backlash, that part of the reason for this increased effective polarization is some sort of reaction to the perception that the other side is going too far. So, do you, do you, do you, what are the data saying in terms of uh, a disconnection between perceptions of, of partisan differences as opposed to actual partisan differences? And to what extent do you think this is contributing to this? Uh, increasing effective polarization and what do you think can be done about it yeah right so there is there's a lot of good research um, suggesting that we perceive polarization to be much worse than it actually is um, and that if you inform people that that Democrats and Republicans are not as polarized as they think they are that does attenuate affective polarization so it makes people you know hate the other party a little bit less um, so that's one that's one part of it um, I, I, the backlash I, that I see is actually the backlash against this this idea of sort of social progress, um, where the for the first time I think in forever the the Democratic Party is actually really pushing um, a platform of of a, a real revolution in social hierarchy, and uh, to have an entire political party take that position is pretty unprecedented. And so the, the backlash that I'm seeing is the traditional sort of white, supre white supremacy patriarchy side is forced into the Republican party to, 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 um, to combat that, right? So the backlash is coming from the sort of anti-diversification forces. 
Uh, and that's that to me is the is the biggest conflict between the U.S. parties right now, and I think probably in other places as well, not necessarily parties, but the left and the right, and that the left is really imagining the world as a as as a, you know sort of a different type of hierarchy, and the right is pushing back against that as hard as as much as they possibly can, and that's the back that's the backlash that I'm that I think is most clear. Well, you're related to the issue of uh, um, cultural backlash. Uh, I'd like get I'd like to get back to the challenge that uh, Danny initially um, posed to the proponents of the cultural uh, view on this uh, on this panel, uh, where he said that you know culture is uh, somewhat stable usually, and we cannot have uh, that a constant so cultural values explain change uh, over time. Uh, so therefore, Danny's conclusion it cannot be that culture alone explains why we observe the momentous changes in the political system that we observe today. Um, so now I think there's, there's one alternative theory here um, that people have proposed, which is uh, also linked to economics a little bit, but in a different way than what, uh, what Danny uh, discussed, um, which is the view that over the past 40 or 50 years, uh, Western societies have become uh, richer uh, increasingly. Uh, and that has, you know, somehow uh, involved a process of modernization that has also changed people's values uh, uh, in a more universalist uh, direction, right? So, um, and that is, of course, especially true uh, uh, for the educational uh, elites uh, in, in, in Western nations. Um, and, uh, you know, there's, there, there's a potential uh, theory here which is that what we observe in terms of the, the move of uh, right-wing populism, that that is not a response to the labor market shocks that Danny uh, alludes to, but that, that it is instead uh, an immediate reaction to um, the political left's increasing universalism uh, that has evolved over the last 30 or 40 years. Now, and, and that is, I think, a real challenge for the economic uh, viewpoint here, because it does involve an element of change in cultural values. Uh, so it's not just uh, you know a cultural constant as as Danny called it initially. Um, so I, I was wondering how the economists on the panel think about this. Yeah, Danny, you can start. Go ahead, go ahead, Leo. No, I mean I, I don't think it needs necessarily to imply a change, right? I mean if if you see one party moving, you perceive a party moving further away from where your your cultural uh, positions are you might just react to that, even though your cultural positions aren't necessarily changing, right? So it has to do, I, I think, part of it with the perception that, you know, the other side is going too far, which goes back to the discussion we're just having now with Liliana. Um, and also, also related to what I was talking about in my presentation, I think it's not just people becoming, say, more xenophobic, more extremist now. I think there a lot of it was just latent uh, sentiment that was there that, uh, that you felt like you know you, you didn't feel comfortable expressing or you didn't feel that there was a need to express you know and now we just feel unleashed and i think it's a combination of a number of different factors is 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 the growth of these movements the, the appearance of candidates open endorsing that but also you know technologies like social media for example that helps uh you know people find uh like-minded people and, and form these groups and so on uh so i think there's there's a combination of factors that could lead to that, that don't necessarily imply a change, you know, that not necessarily reflect a change in, in people's uh, uh, cultural positions, but, you know, it could just be like facilitating the expression of pre-existing views. Uh, I think it, it's a little bit of both, but I think there's a lot of it is just, you know, pre expression of, of pre-existing views um, that, that is just made, made, being facilitated now. No, I mean, I, I largely agree with that. I mean, I think, you know, this is, you know, I mean, the way I see it, you know, the economic shocks and their broader political implications work off of many of these latent divisions in society. And, and some of those divisions um, have to do with, with values, norms, and culture, sort of senses of identity, which uh, may or may not be salient uh, at the time of, of voting. And I think what um, either directly the shocks themselves or through the effect of, you know, it's kind of the narrative and the language that political parties and political leaders use, uh, I think the relative salience of uh, some of these uh, cultural or identity issues, uh, you know, can, can be elevated. Uh, I think that's sort of, I think, um, what has happened. Um, I think it's very difficult to sort this out 
you know, the causality. I, I don't know of any studies that have actually been able to find so exogenously get, give us effects on you know, changes in, in values or culture. There are, as you know, economic studies that have looked at sort of exogenous shocks with respect to either, you know, the NAFTA trade shock in the, in, you know, the 1990s or, you know, the China trade shock. So sort of directly measurable, um, you, know, you know, plausibly exogenous uh, shocks to economic circumstances. And those studies have shown uh, that, you know, they, they, they do produce these political polarization effects. And interestingly, some of these sh studies show that they also produce attitudinal changes with respect to, you know, greater belief in, uh, you know, in, in authoritarianism, uh, sort of, um, you know, to some degree, some of these sort of, you know, there's, there's you know, some correlation with the, some, you know, changes in norms that Leo was talking about uh, as well. So, uh, you know, the evidence that we have, the empirical evidence we have, I think does show that it's sort of a, a certain arrow uh, from, uh, from the economic shocks. But I find the, the, you know, the other stories and the one that you laid out, Ben, is sort of these secular, uh, you know, changes um, associated with broad economic and social development. I think that's, you know, the kinds of thing that um, uh, my colleague Pippa Norris and, and, um, and um, has, has outlined in her book, I think that's, sounds very plausible too. Yeah, I just want to add, oh, sorry, go ahead, Liliana. Oh, I was just, I think the idea that culture doesn't change or it changes very slowly. Um, I think it's just, it's not necessarily that, that that is true because it's not that culture is changing in a linear fashion. It's more of a punctuated equilibrium. So I do think that we've had many cultural shocks um, at least in the history, I'm, I study American politics, so I, I keep going back to America, but um, at least in the history of American politics, um, you know, the end of slavery was a massive cultural shock as well as an economic shock, but um, the, and then the end of reconstruction and then the end of Jim Crow and then the Voting Rights Act, right? We have these sort of massive cultural changing events that then have, you know, have social and psychological ripples down the line as well. Um, it's, I think we just don't tend to model them as, um, as sort of events that we can think about in a in that sort of economic context. And I, I just wanted to add related to Danny's point. I think I, think, I, I really believe that you know uh, that there there are latent sentiments that just are there for many times, as research has shown for centuries, even millennia sometimes, that can usually be activated when things become more salient. There's fascinating recent work, for example showing that uh, uh, when there was uh, uh, in the default, the Greek default crisis, uh, the areas that were originally more hit by German presence in, during the war, are the, war uh, are the areas that reacted more strongly in terms of boycotting purchases of German cars, for example. So there's this idea that there's something back in the back of your mind that you're already thinking, and sometimes it becomes more salient. It could be economic shocks that are making more salient and so on. And then that just comes uh, front and center. So. I think I agree. It's it's not something that is either there or not, you know, or that exists or doesn't exist. But it's, I think it's a little bit more nuanced, uh, which makes this an interesting problem to study. Okay, great. Um, I'm I'm now going to invite Adriana to uh, join the panel uh, and then invite questions uh, from other participants. Thank you, yes. Audrey. Thank you, uh, and thanks to all our panelists for such an interesting uh, discussion. We have some questions from our audience here and also those joining in YouTube. Uh, first, I'd like to invite uh, Rakesh to join us and, and ask his question to the panelists. Hi, uh, thank you for this great session. Earlier when you were talking about this cleavage, uh, particularly in the US between kind of the wealthy and the poor whites on one hand and educated on the other, in your view, to what extent is the erosion of trades unions uh, contributing to that cleavage? Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'll add another question um, and then uh, so we can have a whole round uh, before you answer. Um, we have a question from Yusuf, um, who's joining us from Turkey uh, on YouTube. Uh, he's asking what's the role of Twitter usage into xenophobia? people might not feel shame over social media. And so if the percentage of Twitter users has increased after Trump's election, then xenophobia might be higher. And maybe if I can add something to this question uh, related to what Yusuf is asking, uh, 
what can we do to compensate the effect of social media in polarization and creating conflict in the dynamics between groups? Some people have argued for more regulation. Others argue that regulation would hinder freedom of speech. So what are your views on, on this? Maybe we can now um, uh, give some time for the panelists to, to answer these questions and, and we can add more after that. Well, thanks, uh, Rakesh and Yusuf. Uh, these are uh, great questions. I'm, I'm going to delegate the first question about the trade unions uh, to our trade economists. Uh, and then the, the second question um, about the role of social media to uh, Liliana and Leo. Trade union and international trade, you understand, are two. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm happy to to say I, I, I'm glad that uh, that 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 Rakesh did raise that because I think when we were earlier discussing the the repositioning of the left and parties of the left, I think we we decline we we neglected to mention uh, the decline of uh, of labor unions as, as as a critical factor in that, and I think that's obviously is also linked to the process of of deindustrialization, but I think as the traditional sort of labor union base of uh, central left parties um, has, has weakened. Um, you know, the, 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 the central left parties in some sense have been untethered uh, um, from sort of the interests of, sort of, if you will, the working class, which labor unions uh, represented. And I think that's an important factor uh, for why, you know, sort of on, on economic policy front, they've sort of, have, you know, found it increasingly easier to, to move towards the right. Um, and um, I think so that's, that is indeed a, a, an important factor. I would add that there's, um, there's some good political science research su suggesting that labor union membership is correlated with racial tolerance, higher racial tolerance. Um, so the union itself seems to cultivate more um, sort of liberal racial attitudes. Um, as to the social media question, this is a this is an unanswered question. It's on we don't have we don't have a solid <laughs> answer to this question. We get, we you know the idea that we're in echo chambers is is kind of being challenged by recent um, research. People aren't entirely in echo chambers. In fact, they're exposed to a lot of of um, information from from the other sort of end of the political spectrum. Although that also uh, polarizes people when they see information from the other end of the political spectrum. Um, all, but then there's also this finding that people who who were uh, who were paid to quit Facebook for a month came out of the other on the other end less polarized as well. So um, you know we're not entirely sure about the effects of this, and that's partly because it's really difficult to study um, to study social media uh, behavior because a lot of this data is proprietary, and so we can't get it. Um, but also because it's just it's it's a really big question and it's a really new problem. Um, and clearly there's a different type of, of conversation going on and, that, and it's much easier to find people who are like you in very individualistic ways. Um, but yeah, that's, it's a really good question because we're still, we're still working on it. So let me add uh, to this. I think there, 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 in the economic side, there's some recent work really uh, trying to precisely identify the effect of social media on, uh, on xenophobia and hate crimes. And, and just starting from the conceptual side, there, there are different mechanisms through which uh, social media could potentially lead to that. One is simple coordination. You find like-minded people, it's easier to coordinate activities, including hate crime. Another one is a persuasion channel, which is on social media, you can find anything, including very fringe uh, theories and so on. And there's so there's there are groups and so on that you might be persuaded and adopt these opinions. Or another one is just a, a social norms or social acceptability channel in the sense that I uh, suppose you, you had already had uh, what was considered a fringe view and you didn't have an audience for it. Now you do have an audience for it. So that changes, it creates incentives for you to just express it. Now the social acceptability, you change your, your reference group and this new reference group is social acceptable. There is, uh, I, 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 I have done myself work on, on the subject in uh, using data from uh, Russia, using possibly exogenous uh, expo uh, variation in, in social media penetration across Russian cities. And we do find evidence that led to changes in attitudes and also increasing hate crimes uh, through a channel of, of coordination. There's also very recent, nice recent work on Twitter um, 
showing that uh, there's also looking at some interesting identification strategy for exposure to Twitter at the city level that also led to uh, to increase in, in, in hate crimes against Muslims. And interestingly, they are able to identify a cause effect of uh, Trump's tweets on, on hate crimes against Muslims. And they, they exploit this very interesting. They, uh, they, they realize that when uh, Trump is playing golf, he's unsupervised. Uh, so his tweets tend to be more inflammatory against Muslims. So they look at uh, his agenda, his, his calendar, really, when he's playing golf. He, he tweets um, more inflammatory things against Muslims and in areas that are more likely to be exposed to these tweets, you see an increase in, in hate crimes against Muslims. So it's, I think it's pretty convincing uh, and creative uh, work. Uh, so, but I agree, we're really just scratching the surface of this big, big, big question, this big monster, right? Social media. For many years, we thought this was just a great thing. They were just bringing positive things to society. And now we're just learning that, in fact, there, there are very bad things that happen. You know, it's very difficult to, 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 to understand what's being shared, to regulate what we do about it. There's all these issues of free speech versus, you know, the consequences of what's being posted out there. And, you, and you, you know, we think it's bad on Twitter and Facebook. It gets even worse when you think about uh, platforms such as WhatsApp, because we have no idea what's going on there. Those are private groups. You, you, you see what the spread of rumors in countries like India, for example, that led to lynches, lynching and so on. And we have there, it's, it's just another level. It's even more complicated because we don't even know what's, what's being shared and discussed. So I think it's one of the big policy questions of our kind is how to think about it, how to think about regulating social media. And, and I, 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 I think there's gonna be a big discussion uh, in, in the coming years on the subject. Thank you. I think we have another question uh, from uh, from the audience from Gordon Hansen. Thanks to the panel for just a great discussion so far. And I wanted to throw something out that I think might uh, connect the cultural and, and economic arguments to some extent. And that in in Ben's work in, on moral foundations theory, you know, loyalty is is one of those foundations. And um, that in, in the current context, loyalty involves identity in terms of your place. And one of the things that really differentiates cosmopolitan elites versus working class votes is the importance of place in terms of your identity. And the economic changes that Danny talked about have led to a, an erosion in value of place. And so that economic impact can actually manifest itself in, in, a, in a cultural sense. So I wanted to throw that out there and see what you guys thought. Yeah, I'm. Uh, I'm going to start out um, uh, uh, on this one. I, I think that's a very interesting observation, and uh, I think it, it connects to uh, an alternative way to think about morality, which is linked to functional economic accounts of where values come from in the first place. Right. So, is um, if we think about the heterogeneity in, in moral values that we that we see. Uh, uh, in the Western world. And as you said, it's typically true that people in rural areas tend to emphasize community-based concepts uh, like loyalty more uh, than people in the urban centers. Uh, and it's of course easy in principle to think of that as a functional economic response, right? Because if you think, if you live in an environment, if you live in Manhattan, uh, where you constantly interact with strangers, where you don't know your butcher personally, then emphasizing values like loyalty is not going to be uh, uh, um, important uh, in determining your economic and social success. But on the other hand, if you live uh, in a small town uh, uh, in rural Germany, say, then of course the extent to which you are loyal to your friends, to your neighbors and so on, does have uh, a significant effect on uh, whether you're gonna succeed economically and socially in, in your local environment. So I think there's a very interesting connection between the type of values that are economically functional and how different economic shocks then affect uh, uh, the distribution of, the, of those values. Um, but I think the other panelists will also have uh, something interesting to, to say about this. Uh, I would just uh, add that uh, there's a fantastic book by Kathy Kramer called The Politics of Resentment, um, where uh, she actually does sort of an ethnography of rural um, Wisconsinites and, uh, and tries to figure out sort of what is the, you know, what is the what is happening with this sort of rural versus urban divide uh just in the state of wisconsin but it, it's fantastic she does a fantastic job and 
Um, one of the main things that she's finding is that the people in rural areas are, they believe that their tax dollars are all flooding to the cities and, and none of it is coming back to benefit them. They think it's all going to sort of those people in, in the cities of Wisconsin. And, um, and so there's a resentment economically um, for, among rural, uh, rural people towards cities. Um, but there's also this, this sense of, you know, we've been waiting in line and the, and those people stood in line, got in line in front of us, right? They cut their, they cut into line and we've been doing all the right things and trying to get ahead. And, um, and, you know, those people keep jumping in line in front of us. And so there, there's a, it's a, I mean, it's a, it's a great look at how deep and broad this, this rural resentment towards urban areas is. But, but I think what, what, what uh, Liliana just, uh, just said underlines something very important that, that Gordon alluded to, which is that the, the economic shocks that, that Danny keeps highlighting, they affect people with different values differentially, right? So the universalists that live in the big cities, they suffer less um, uh, from the erosion of social networks that are sometimes associated with economic shocks, just because they don't depend on these social networks to the same degree uh, as people that live in more rural areas. Um, so I think that's a very important observation. Um, Leo and Danny, do you want to add something to this discussion? Otherwise, I'm going to move on. I just, I think, it, I think it's a fascinating hypothesis, and I think it would be great if we could make more progress on this. I do think it's very difficult to isolate from a common shock the extent to which this is affecting people's eventual political choices through one channel versus another. For example, if there's a shock to your home value, to your property value, you know, that might hurt more your sense of identity, uh, but at the same time, you're also losing the economic side. I think there's some progress to be made in terms of looking at heterogeneity along the lines of what uh, uh, Ben was suggesting that, you know, there may be underlying uh, moral values that could, you know, uh, potentially uh, help us in ident separately identifying these, these two factors. But I do think it's a challenging question to answer. Um, and, and but also, I think it's a, it's a fascinating one. So I, think, I think I think the the, the the point that Gordon raises is is very important. I mean, again, we have a bit of a difficulty extricating sort of cause and effect because the value value placed on place it could also be related to the fact that you know relatively less mobile, less skilled um, uh, households and, and individuals, because they cannot move, they're they're more likely to. Um, to um, uh, to to take on sort of cosmopolitan values um, that that would uh, validate their their choices, um, but whatever it is, I mean, I think one thing that this points out to is that there is a kind of a, a reinforcing cycle here that could that's very important, which Will Wilkinson, I think, in, in the U.S. context has has emphasized, which is that you know if you know when you when you have these shocks and and the people who can take advantage through mobility by moving towards larger metropolitan centers are precisely the skilled or or the ones that have more cosmopolitan values um, then the ones who are left behind are, are precisely those whose views on the importance of place and whose you know resentments towards uh, what's happening in the large cities um, are going to be amplified and that sort of there's a kind of reinforcing cycle uh, that 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 ha that 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 keeps making the situation worse. But um, so maybe we can have a one final quick question. I think Asim uh, has a question here or a comment. Great, thank you. Uh, thank you so much. This was fascinating. Uh, I just wanted to uh, say one small comment and then question back to the audience, uh, to the panelists. Uh, the comment is, you know, while we're talking a lot about the U.S., clearly the U.S. is. Um, it's just a tip of the iceberg. The, the trends we're seeing are global. It's everywhere. So I don't think any explanation which is inherent or specific to the U.S. in a in a deeper, subtle way is probably the likely explanation. It's everywhere. Um, the two comments I wanted to make were came really from our previous session. So Michael Ignatiev in the first session kind of highlighted, in, at least in his uh, views, education is a big divide. But the one thing he said which was interesting, uh, and both of these questions are going to be related to preferences specifically, he alluded to the fact that look, politicians will be politicians in terms of exploiting polarization. That's what you try and do. You try and divide in some ways. I'm re um, paraphrasing what he said. But then he also kind of alluded to this idea of politician preferences. 
or a higher morality or an institutional norm that politicians should be advocating for. And I wanted to come, kind of come back to the audience, say, uh, to the panelists, sorry, and say, is, th is that something we should be thinking about? Is the type of politicians going to be different now? Are politicians' preferences are getting more unchecked now? Or are they changing because of these forces? So treat the politician as an actor with agency as opposed to someone who's just responding to the forces. And the second question coming back to this idea, and this came from the Nobel panel yesterday. So both Abhijit and Esther were kind of very strongly advocating for, I guess, changing preferences, arguing that you know, this us versus them language is not a language we should be responding to, but rather a language we should be aggressively pushing back on. And I wanted to kind of see if what you guys thought about such an active approach, whether that's an expression of changing simply the expression of preferences. To Leo's point, you don't have to change preferences, you just have to stop people from expressing them and acting upon them. Or uh, should we be really thinking about deeply changing preferences? And if so, how do we go about doing that? Okay, so I think I'm going to defer the question on elite polarization to uh, the political scientist Liliana on the panel, uh, and then the second one uh, to Leo. Uh, yeah, that's a that's a great point. Um, there is, uh, if you look sort of at the history of the rhetoric around politics, there's a sort of very clear changing point in 1994 or 1995, there was a, a memo that came out of Newt Gingrich's office uh, that is now just referred to as the GOPAC memo. Uh, effectively, that was uh, to the new freshman class um, in, the, in the House that had just been elected, of Republicans who had just been elected in 1994, making up a majority of the House for the first time in 40 years. And it basically was, the memo said, this is how you talk like Newt. And so when you're talking about Democrats, you should use words like poison, treason, cancer. And when you talk about Republicans, you should, you should use words like family, responsibility, courage. And so it, it literally had a list of, of words that were recommended. They were extremely polarizing words. Uh, and, and from that point on, we, heard, we started seeing this very, very radical kind of rhetoric coming out of the right, which then of course, spreads everywhere. Uh, so the it is possible to have a politics that isn't as radical and doesn't use that type of, of really truly um, upsetting terminology, but that's where we have been really for the last 30, 20 years. I just wanted to wrap up also on the second question that Asim asked. Um, I think it's, 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 it's a fundamental question, not, not an easy question to answer. Um, the extent you know to which you can you can if, either if it's in either case if it's changes in preferences or in changes in willing access in willing access to express pre-existing views uh, it's, i think it's a very difficult process because even issues associated with what i was describing as backlash for example i have a student has some, some work showing that if you randomly report people for their hateful tweets uh and they get the tweets get deleted they just become more hateful subsequently uh, it's just like, you know, it's, it's, I think it's very hard in, in, in a current environment to just push back against things because people might just react more strongly uh, and, and more general, even if it's just a matter of what I was describing in my paper, that people are just more comfortable expressing these views. How do you, once someone learned that there are more bigots out there than they previously believed, how do you convince them that that's not okay? Now they, it's, it's out the door already, you know? It's, so it's... Uh, so I think it's a very complicated process, and and how how do you create you know uh, uh, you know uh, uh, an environment where people are more tolerant, uh, both in terms of what they think and, and how they express themselves? I think it's a very challenging environment, uh, very challenging uh, uh, question, and and I, I frankly don't have don't think there's an easy solution to that, uh, and I think it would require a lot of debate, pushing. Okay, um, well thank you all very much. Uh, Thanks to the panelists for the great discussion. I think we're out of time. Um, I, I wanna point out to uh, the attendees uh, that the last session of the Gem Week 2020 takes place tomorrow uh, with, a, with another keynote speak by uh, Hugo Mercier, uh, who will talk about the essence of human reasoning. Uh, and uh, as additional panelists, we will have Ricardo Hausman. So I think you'll be able to join. Uh, thank you very much for being part of this event and uh, hope you're well. Thank you all. Thank you, everyone.